Hi everyone, this is Ricky Spencer and we're here again for the Sociology of Media Voices series. Today, we have someone who may be recognisable to many people. Um, he's a well-known artist and he's by the name of Richard Watts. Um, he's the Arts Hub National Performing Arts Editor. He also presents the weekly program Smart Hearts on the community radio station 3 R FM and serves as the chair at La Mama Theatre Volunteer Committee of Management. Richard is a life member of the Melbourne Queer Film Festival and was awarded the status of Melbourne Fringe Festival Living Legend in 2017. Not many people out there can be a living legend, but no, our Richard Watts is. So aren't we glad that we've got him with us? He is also the founder of both the Pink Magpies, the first LGBTIQ supporters group in the a AFL, and the Emerging Writers Festival, and co-founding, co-founded the life, the, li the long-running Melbourne Club Night Q and A Queer and Alternative. In 2019, Richard was awarded the Sydney Meyer Performing Arts Award Facilitators Prize. Most recently, he won, he was presented with a lifetime achievement awarded by the Green Room Awards Association in June 2021. Here today is Richard Watts. Yay! Hi, Richard. Hey, Ricky. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm flattered to be here. Oh, look, we're so happy to have you. Oh, there's so much to, to unpack about you, this creative space you've created within yourself and the community. Can we learn a little bit about Richard? What was Richard like growing up? Um, well, I was born on Jarjawaran country up in Bendigo. Um, both my parents were teachers. Mm. Uh, and because they were teachers and because Dad liked um, new challenges. Every four or five years, we'd move to a different school where dad would teach uh, and I'd be uprooted. So I very quickly learned that um, uh, one of the things that I could rely on and sustain kind of passion in was um, to begin with writing. You can see kind of some crowded bookshelves behind me. Um, I'm not as voracious a reader as I used to be when I was younger, partially because um, DVDs and streaming services and Facebook and so on have quite possibly damaged my attention span, as I'm sure uh, uh, is uh, possibly true with a, a few other people as well. Um, but yeah, so grew up in country Victoria, um, most of my childhood down in Gippsland and the Latrobe Valley, moved to Melbourne uh, when I was about 18, 19, having moved out of home when I was 17. And Melbourne has pretty much been my adopted home ever since, apart from a, a brief stint living in Mullumbimby up in northern New South Wales. I moved there for love, uh, broke up very soon afterwards, moved back to Melbourne and oh. have pretty much stayed here ever since. Oh, we're glad you, you've, you've, you're here with us. So tell us, how did you become started to become in the art space? Well... I guess the love of books that I had as a kid, <coughs> and excuse me, I have a slight cough, so I do apologise, luckily not COVID. <coughs> um, so yeah, as a child in, particularly in primary school and early high school, um, that love of reading then slowly extended to a love of music through my parents' record collection initially before starting to find my own music. Mum um, was, mum and dad met, on a student production of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's, I think the Mikado, when they oh. were at Peaches College in the 1960s. Um, and my mum had always had a love of musicals. Um, so fairly traditional gay teenager, musical theatre became something I was interested in. Oh. I also um, started doing jazz ballet. I was the only boy in the entire class in our country town in Trafalgar, down in the Latrobe Valley. Uh, and by year 10, I'd started um, auditioning for the high school musicals that we did. So kind of performed in high school musicals. After school, I tried one or two professional auditions and very quickly realised that to succeed in the performing arts as an artist, you have to have an enormous amount of self-belief and self-confidence, which as a kind of kid growing up in the country who'd been queer bashed constantly throughout high school, I didn't have. I was very insecure. Um, so I stopped wanting to perform and focused more on creative writing as a 
as a, a kind of, I guess, an adjunct to initially and then a growth out of reading. So by the, by the 90s uh, and living in Melbourne, I started, my writings embraced poetry and spoken word. I started going to uh, readings at uh, the Perseverance Hotel on Brunswick Street, for example. Mm. I started performing spoken word with some of my friends' bands in the Melbourne punk scene. Um, uh, and that then led to me being recruited to work at Next Wave Festival in about 98, oh, 99. Yes. So, and that was my first professional gig in the arts industry. Campion Descent, who was the artistic director of the festival, which uh, biennial and running um, at that stage, it was going to be the 2000 festival. Um, he called me in for a chat. I just thought he wanted to pick my brains about the Melbourne poetry and spoken word scene. Turned out he was offering me a job. Um, so <clears throat> I got involved with arts administration that way. That led to then working at Express Media, the youth arts organisation, a few years later with the abortive Mullumbimby experiment in between, um, joining the board of Melbourne Fringe, um, mm. joining a, a, a committee at the National Gallery of Victoria to advise them on their kind of youth programs. Uh, even at that stage, I was a bit too old to be youth. I was in, in my early 30s, but I was probably one of the youngest people uh, that the NGV had to, to chat to and because of Express Media being a youth arts organisation, I could ask young people directly and help funnel them in towards the NGV. So it was young people shaping policy rather than people like me shaping. Um, uh, and so that just kind of had a flow on effect. Uh, and so here we are in 2021, um, I got headhunted to work as um, an arts journalist at Arts Hub back in 2009. My writing had, by that stage, uh, started to embrace reviewing and critique and feature writing initially for the gay and lesbian press, um, uh, then The Age, uh, and simultaneously I branched off into broadcasting at 3RRR. So it was never planned. It was all entirely kind of accidental, um, mm -hmm. but it's been something that has, has sustained me kind of emotionally, uh, mentally, and financially now for many years. Mm. And tell me this... You give so much to the media. How much of that of yourself do you find when you write and you critique? How much of that you let go of Richard? What is left once you've done that at home? That's a really interesting question because in some ways it's not so much letting go of Richard as diving down deep uh, into who I am. Um, mm. The criticism in particular I mean, all criticism is essentially, um, it is uh, kind of deeply personal in many ways. It's mm. highly subjective and it's based on, in my case, a lifetime of seeing work. Um, Pre-pandemic, I'd see 160, 180 shows a year covering everything from main stage and independent theatre through to cabaret and contemporary dance and comedy and circus and puppetry and so much more when you see that much work and when you engage with it critically, when you start to analyze what kind of, what makes it work, you can then also start to be more aware of what doesn't work. Mm. Um, so certainly I would say my criticism is very, very deeply personal. Um, and even kind of arts journalism, for example, uh, I think there is a, journalists like to pretend that they are unbiased, um, which is, not true. Every journalist mm. brings the sum of their own experiences, their own personal biases to a story. Some media outlets hide those biases more than others. Some lean into them. Uh, thinking of The Australian, for example, mm. um, where the, the, the media bias is very specific and very pronounced. And I, I am fairly certain that uh, for my radio program on 3 R, for example, my personal biases, but also my personal passions and interests and everything that make me who I am feed into that program. I remember uh, I've been doing Smart Arts on Triple R now for 15 years. It must have been 10 or 12 years ago when the station commissioned some surveys as part of uh, kind of audience research and so forth. <coughs> And one of the pieces of feedback that was passed on to me was just some, a couple of people commenting how refreshing it was to hear openly queer presenters uh, casually mentioning their, I don't know, the, kind of, uh, their boyfriend or ex-boyfriend or um, uh, some of the things that had shaped them. 
and I know that was specifically a reference to me, but also one or two other presenters as well. So um, I think in, rather than letting go of who I am, my, my writing and my broadcasting um, is informed by who I am at, at every step of the way. Journalism, particularly uh, kind of hard news is a little different. Um, personal bias is still an issue there, um, but you're also trying to adapt in terms of the writing style, uh, a slightly, I guess what you would call a journalistic tone, slightly dispassionate voice. You don't editorialize so much as opposed to writing an opinion piece where you can be very deeply personal, kind of very angry, very grief struck, depending on what you're writing about. Tell me this, um, this deep struct and this, these feelings. Have you ever had people that you've written or critiqued the show that perhaps wasn't so favourable for the particular company or the people presented or, or piece that they performed? Have they, how have they contacted you and how did that sort of play out for you? Um, earlier in my writing career, um, some of my criticism was very blunt and very unsubtle and a bit too personal. Um, uh, there's an example on my blog, uh, which I haven't updated for five or six years, but I used to be a, <coughs> a regular, a place where I would regularly write. And I maintained then, and I still maintain now to a degree, that writing for a blog, writing a piece of personal kind of uh, opinion is different to writing a measured and considered review for publication in a uh, in a media outlet. A blog is more akin to a diary entry. Um, mm. But I wrote a very, very savage, very unsubtle kind of piece when I attended the premiere of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, the, the musical. Oh, um, yes. Mm. I, I look back on that piece now and I... It, yeah, it's a it's a, a piece of juvenilia in some regards. Um, I would not write in that way now even if I was writing some, something that, because a blog is still a piece of public opinion and it's designed for public consumption, even though it's a very personal piece of writing nonetheless. <coughs> um, but there were, it wasn't much, and, and that piece, there was, I know uh, I pissed off some, uh, the director of that particular work, for example, um, uh, to the point when a couple of years later I congratulated him on a new show he directed, saying how much I enjoyed it. He somewhat snippily said, well, that must have been a surprise for you. Um, he had been stung by my criticism of, of the work. Um, <clears throat> and I think in particular hurt by kind of how very blunt it was. But I've had other pieces of criticism that have written a little bit more recently that have been more measured and, and considered and that have been for that I, what I would consider professional criticism as opposed to kind of like uh, late night blogging, um, um, in which one of the, the, the most lovely pieces of feedback I got was from a director who I looked at a work and, and I did what I often do in journalism and, and in particular arts criticism, where you're not saying why you liked or didn't like a work. That's not, a, that's not the job of a critic or a reviewer. Your job is to say what worked and what didn't work in your eyes and explain and argue why. It's akin to writing an essay in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and in this particular instance, uh, it was a production of Malthouse Theatre. Um, I noted that uh, of all the music that was incorporated into the piece, there was one song that just didn't fit thematically, dramatically. Um, and it was about two years later that the director caught up with me on a staircase um, at a, a, a different opening night and said, oh, by the way, I'm remounting that show that you had some issues with. I've cut out that song. You were right, it didn't work. Um, uh, which is not to kind of try to big note myself, but it's to say that often when a piece of criticism is delivered, the person who it is written about may be far too close to the work. It's brand new. They're living it. They've spent months making it. It's just been released out into the world. They aren't ready and they don't want to hear kind of considered critical kind of feedback like that, which is why on an opening night at a theatre, if the director of a show says, what did you think? I will sometimes pause and say, do you really want me to tell you or do you want to wait until the review has been published? Or I will turn it around and say, were you happy with it? 
Were you happy with the performances? Were you happy, happy with the, the energy of opening night? Opening nights can be so weird and so stressful. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes they go, oh, you're really avoiding the subject. But other times it gives them a chance to talk about how they feel. But I, because for me, criticism is important for a number of reasons. One of which is it documents particularly theatre criticism, dance criticism, etc. It documents an ephemeral art form. Mm -hmm. uh, and the review, the piece of criticism exists in years to come so that people can go, I made this work and here's what people thought. They can use that to, um, uh, for a grant application, but it also contributes to a greater body of work which documents trends and changes and aspects of Australian theatre, which could be important to an academic writing in 10 years, 20 years, 100 years time. Not just my writing, but everybody's writing. <clears throat> so I think criticism is important for that reason and it's one of the reasons why I recommend to artists not to engage with criticism so much because it isn't necessarily written for them. There may be some feedback in them for them to consider when they're not so close to the piece, but it's written for posterity. It's written in some cases for the general public um, as a, a guide to whether they should spend their hard earned dollars on a uh, what could be a very expensive ticket. So uh, yeah, but the, the individual response to criticism is something I take into account, but it's certainly not my the the major factor I'm considering when I'm crafting a piece of of arts criticism or or a, a more general review. Mm, interesting, Richard. One of the themes that I was hearing you talk that sort of spoke to me was your role of being authentic and becoming authentic, and the responsibility that you have in your voice whether it be in um, oral review or written review in shaping perhaps sometimes the success of the show in terms of um, financial success do you feel the weight of the pressure sometimes when you do do a review yes and yes i do um uh and particularly when it's um an independent artist or mm. a very sm a small company, or, um, because a, a a juggernaut show like Hamilton or um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child is mm. effectively critic proof. There is such a weight of public opinion, uh, and so many celebrated reviews, and so many people have read the book or listened to the soundtrack that um, even if a hundred critics came out and said the Australian production is terrible that wouldn't have, well, actually, if 100 critics came out, maybe a few people would go, oh, maybe I'll wait six months before I go and see it. It's maybe not ready yet. Um, but to a degree, those shows are somewhat critic-proof. Um, uh, and that's partially because the media landscape has now changed so significantly. Mm. 20 or 30 years ago, the critical opinion published in a newspaper carried much more weight. But now there's the video footage of opening night audiences gushing about how much they love the show. There's the individual people tweeting about how much they love the show or sharing the, their, their joy on Facebook. Um, but particularly, yes, when writing about smaller productions, more independent productions, I know that um, my, my critics, my criticism, my review can carry weight um, and that weight can be damaging in the, in the case of some shows. Uh, there was a show at the comedy festival several years ago, I won't name it, but at that stage I was regularly writing comedy festival reviews for The Age. Um, I gave the show, I think it was a half star review. The friend I was with said, can you give negative stars after we came out of the show together? Two days after I published my review, that show closed two weeks early. Um, now, I know it wasn't just my review that contributed to that, but um, I'm sure that the artists were gutted and I'm sure um, having a, a review published in a broad, in a reputable broadsheet like The Age, probably some people who were considering buying tickets were scared off. Um, and the other thing to, that I think is important to stress is I think some people, particularly some artists, think that critics enjoy writing bad reviews, mm. that we gleefully dip our pen in venom and begin to write. I do not like writing a negative review of a show. I, I try to look for, for the positive, the good, particularly um, if it's something on at Fringe, for example, or um, a young artist's first show at Midsummer or something like that, because I don't want to crush them. I want to offer uh, constructive feedback. 
Um, and I have labored over some negative reviews. I, I've emailed them to friends or colleagues, uh, particularly friends who are perhaps independent editors. Mm. They're not critics themselves, but um, they know how to read, how to spot errors, how to offer feedback. And uh, if, if I'm angsty in over a particularly kind of bad review, I'll say, do you think I'm being unfair? Um, uh, the kind of uh, bullied, anxious teenager in me has never fully gone away. And I never fully necessarily trust my own opinion sometimes, particularly when I know that uh, what I'm going to write or publish uh, or say is going to hurt someone's feelings and 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 in and in particular hurt work that they have spent months, if not years, building towards. Uh, so I take my role as a critic and as a journalist very very seriously. I I would no longer write something as flippant as the the blog piece I mentioned kind of earlier, for example, because it was flippant. It was written after quite a few champagnes at the opening night party, um, uh, and. Uh, it was much more damning than it needed to be. Does that make it difficult, Richard, when you're, say, making friends, that you're more constrained if someone comes to you and says, I'm an artist, I'm starting a production, that you would have to then... How does that work in terms of if, if you had to critique someone that you personally knew? as a friend in a show. Have you ever been in that situation before? I have a rule of thumb where I try to differentiate between friends and colleagues slash acquaintances, for starters. Mm -hmm. um, if I've been out to dinner with somebody, uh, if I've had dinner at their place, if they've had dinner at my place, they're a friend and I can't critique their work. Mm -hmm. Christos Cholkis, the novelist, is a great, is a good example. I'd happily interview him on Triple R about his new novel. Um, I know him, I know his body of work. That mm -hmm. gives me insights that other journalists would not have, but I would not write a review of his new novel, for example, because oh. I've known Christos for too long. Um, I am very happy to <coughs> give feedback to artists. I may not these days, particularly because of my role as the performing arts editor at mm -hmm. Arts Hub, I spend a lot more time uh, editing other people's work, talking to freelancers and so forth. I don't have the time to write reviews anywhere near as much as I used to, but I'm always happy to give feedback to artists about their work. Uh, maybe not in the foyer on opening night because they don't want to hear that. They might want to hear it a couple of days later. Um, but uh, certainly, and it, it's interesting, one of my challenges as a writer and journalist is Unlike colleagues who freelance at the age, for example, who see themselves only as critics and journalists, <coughs> I wear that hat, but kind of, or to put it another way, I have one foot in the world of criticism and journalism, but I have another foot in the world of the arts and artists because I'm on the, I'm the chair of La Mama. I've been on the board of Melbourne Fringe. I've been the chair of Fringe. I've curated festivals. Um, I've established festivals and so forth. I've, I've worked as a spoken word performer and poet in the past, albeit kind of, <coughs> uh, shall we say generously, a, a very ranty, angry kind of uh, form of poetry when I was, I don't know, supporting people like Jello Biafra and Bikini Kill and so forth. Uh, but I, I know the world of the arts. And as a result of that, a lot of artists trust me more to tell their story than they might another journalist, for example, somebody who is just a journalist even though they're, they're an arts journalist, um, because journalists can sometimes, I don't want to say be cutthroat, but I know of examples in recent years where journalists in their eagerness to get a story have rung artists and told them bad news, which the artists themselves hasn't, haven't heard yet mm -hmm. because it's officially embargoed uh, and, the, and the word hasn't got out from say the funding body in question or something like that. Um, I wouldn't do that. I would respect protocol to a degree, which doesn't mean I can't write negative articles about the Australia Council or create New South Wales or uh, creative Victoria and so forth. Um, but I walk a, a, a bit of a tightrope, perhaps, in that regard. One end is journalism, one end is the arts industry, um, and I have to make a call on a case-by-case -case basis as to where I position myself and where I stand. Am I slightly closer to the art side of things for this story or slightly closer to the journalism side of things for the next story. Um, so yeah, it, it varies from day to day. And it also varies depending on the kind of story I'm writing as well. 
One thing you mentioned, Richard, that I wanted to now maybe elaborate a little bit more. You mentioned before how things have changed in terms of technology. Now people have access to instantaneous, I guess, reviews. So via, I'm thinking of Twitter. I'm thinking of Instagram where people can capture an image, write a, um, a couple of words. How has that impacted like your profession in terms of being the editor you know of arts hub when people out in the community are now i guess being trying to be promoting themselves as opinion experts of lived experience of theater and arts does that impact in the work that your community when you're writing or does that or is there a clear distinction you think between the two i think yes it has impacted and those impacts are positive and negative Mm -hmm. um, the negative impacts are, as we've seen, um, uh, dwindling advertising because advertising is now going onto social media platforms mm. instead of directly in, into supporting newspapers and those newspapers then paying journalists with the income from advertising. <coughs> that has had an impact. Um, some critics, particularly some older male critics in particular, um, uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, they hated the rise of blogging as a publishing mm -hmm. tool, for example. Um, and they despised social media because to them it undermined their authority. Mm -hmm. Whereas I saw and still see the growth of a diverse range of opinions and media outlets as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, it means that there has been some erosion of the quote unquote, the authoritative voice. Mm. But when that authoritative voice has been white, 60 plus middle class to upper class male whose worldview has only been shaped by a particular range of opinions and anything outside of the canonical white male writers um, uh, is worthless, then I'm all for the kind of their position and their authority being eroded. Um, I, I'm aware of the irony of this. I'm a 53 year old silver haired white kind of cisgendered man kind of um, who is pontificating professionally about his opinion in the arts. <coughs> um, but I, I genuinely believe that um, the erosion of that singular authoritative voice has been beneficial for the arts and for the, the kind of the broader kind of culture as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I, I kind of welcome that. Uh, I think one of the benefits about um, writing, my writing for Arts Hub and the rest of the team writing at Arts Hub, my colleague Gina Fairley, our visual arts editor, for example, um, we've been in the game long enough that people know our take and know how to read it. It's like back in the day when Adrian Martin was a regular uh, film critic for The Age. Mm -hmm. If he hated something, I'd go and see it because he'd been a critic for so long that kind of I knew that our views were diametrically opposed. Um, uh, so that informed some of our writing. But then nonetheless feeding into that, there is also the fact that Arts Hub has been around working with and for the arts industry for just over 20 years. Mm. I've been there for 12 years. Um, my ability to both advocate for the art sector and hold it to account when, when it needs to be, I, I would hope and I think that is recognised through kind of the, the Green Room Award that I was given this year and so forth, um, that uh, I have a platform which I hope I use for the right reasons. Um, but I also hope that when my time comes, I will know when it's time for me to step away and hand over to somebody who does not look like me and whose lived experience is different to mine and whose voice is different to mine. And how has the industry coped with the last year with COVID and the closing down of our, you know, spaces of culture and entertainment? From where you're sitting in terms of your connections and how are we going in that space at the moment? I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that a, for a, a large percentage of, of the broader art sector, by which I don't just mean the artists, but I mean all those people who work backstage, front of house, 
um, the, the people selling merchandise at, at, a, at a musical, for example, as well as the musicians uh, in the orchestra pit and the actors on stage and the stagehand kind of wheeling in sets and so forth. A lot of people are on their knees. Mm. Uh, the, there has been a considerable lack of support from the state government, uh, sorry, from, not from the state government, the state governments have done a remarkable job, uh, but the federal government has not played the part it could have. Um, uh, for example, the fact that so many people in the industry were not eligible for JobKeeper mm. because they didn't work for the requisite number of months full time for the one company. Um, so many people in, in the industry work from job to job on short term contracts. Um, uh, and as a result, they fell through the cracks of JobKeeper. Um, they were not eligible for that. Uh, they could not be supported and companies who worked with them could not uh, get the support they needed um, in turn. Um, and the uncertainty of kind of COVID at the moment, I think you would be hard pressed to find an artist or somebody working in arts admin at any company, large or small, who um, would criticise lockdown. We know that lockdowns are essential, particularly We've seen it here again in Melbourne, where we've successfully tackled uh, an outbreak of the Delta variant mm. by going into hard lockdown. We know that lockdowns work and that lockdowns are necessary, but the uncertainty of not knowing kind of when a production can reopen, um, when it would have to close again, uh, the challenges of reopening, uh, for example, uh, knowing that when theatres start and galleries and so forth start to reopen from tomorrow, um, they'll be restricted to, I think it's audiences of no more than 100. Mm. And even then the per square metre rule will come into play. It's simply not financially viable for the larger productions like um, Frozen the Musical and Come From Away, uh, which I think is still playing in Sydney or should mm. have still been playing in Sydney. <coughs> Harry Potter, the Melbourne Theatre Company, um, it's not financially viable for those shows, given their overheads and costs, to reopen with 25% of their audience, for example. So that's a real challenge. Um, friends who work um, kind of in the, the, that real gig economy part of, of the art sector are now worried they've lost several weeks of work and this is their fifth lockdown in a row. They don't know how they're going to pay the rent next month. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a frightening time for the sector. Mm. Um, the creative industries are full of people who are full of ideas, who are adaptable, who have had to be resilient because of the nature of their work. People who can think strategically and cleverly um, about uh, in terms of problem solving. You just have to look at the recent uh, community service announcement created by the Mel well, spearheaded by the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra with artists from the Australian Ballet and Melbourne Theatre Company and so many other independent artists like uh, the comedian's tripod and the cabaret artist Meow Meow. They created the most effective go and get vaccinated ad to address vaccine hesitancy in the, in the community that I've seen. If you need a problem solved, ask artists to solve it, but the government is not, the federal government, is not listening to artists um, and the the support the financial support that's being offered at the moment is still going to the major organizations um, four million just this week to opera australia for example and i know that opera australia employ so many people and that the the cancellation of their upcoming production of phantom of the opera uh, in both sydney and melbourne is a huge blow for that company and all the people it works with but there are so many more small to medium theatre companies and dance companies and kind of uh, artist organisations across the company who are the real engine room of the arts and they are not being supported through those kind of funding programs at the moment. So the federal government need to do more because if this pandemic drags on for another two or three years, there so many people in the arts will have left the industry because it will no longer be sustainable for them as a career. They'll have to find other op options in order to support themselves, support their families and pay the rent. Richard, um, now what can we do to people listening at the moment, whether they be a student, um, academic or a member of the community, 
what can we do today, tomorrow, to support our arts community? One of the, the best things to do is to buy tickets for shows. Uh, and if those shows are cancelled, if it's within your capacity to do so, donate the cost of that ticket to the, mm -hmm. to the company and to the production, rather than asking for a refund, obviously. That is not possible for everybody, particularly students, for example. Mm -hmm. You can also advocate for the sector. Write to your local MP, particularly your federal MP, and tell them that you believe the Australian art sector is important. Um, I think there is still a belief that the arts are a niche product for elite audiences. Australia seems to have no trouble with elite sport. Um, mm. uh, currently, the Olympics are on in Tokyo, despite I think 80% of people in Japan not wanting the Olympics to go ahead. And so many of the Australian public are reveling in the, the skill of elite, elite, elite athletes. And why not revel in the skills of elite performers as well? Um, so help persuade government that people love the arts and people need the arts, that we need its transformative power. Um, and not just to change our worldview. I mean, there's a, I just saw a recent study that talked about the way that uh, attending the theatre increases people's levels of empathy, for mm. example, by allowing us to identify with and understand and empathise with people who are not us, who are other and outside our, our worldview. And that going to the theatre apparently also helps uh, increase and drive uh, people's desire to uh, become philanthropists just in small ways, to donate to a local charity or something. So theatre drives empathy and we need empathy in the world at the moment. Um, so I would certainly encourage people to write to their federal politicians to tell them why the arts are important to you as an individual um, and to point out that one of the things that has sustained us all through lockdown, regardless of what city we're in or what town we're in, is art. We have turned to art in greater numbers, and whether that's watching a beautifully written and directed and acted show on Netflix whether it's rereading your favourite novel, whether it's streaming music, or if you're a dinosaur like me, putting on a CD. We have been sustained by art so much throughout lockdown and throughout the pandemic to date. So surely that shows us how important, how necessary art is, how valuable it is, not in economic terms, and it has that value as well. It's an enormously important contributor to the Australian economy, but I don't want to use the argument of neoliberalism when we're trying to persuade government to support the arts because they're not listening when we use those arguments. Let's talk to government about how art makes us feel, how art gets us through the day-to-day, -day, how it gets us through lockdown, how art inspires, how art makes kids um, better socialised, how it helps kids address anxiety through kind of through theatre sports and games and circus. And there are more studies that show that it does just that. So support your artists by buying tickets to their work um, or going to see their shows um, and support them by trying to convince the federal government and the federal opposition because they may come into power at some stage sooner or later. They all need to know that we as people, as Australians, not only believe in the arts and love the arts, but we need it. We need it deeply. Richard Watts, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so much for sharing your ideas, your knowledge, and your passion for the arts community. On behalf of Sociology of Media Voices, we thank you for your time. Ricky, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.